Hello, everyone. Today we're going to talk about triacylglycerol cycle and glyceronylogenesis. So, for our real life biochemistry question, today we have Have you ever thought how some oral medications can help improve blood sugar control in type 2 diabetes mellitus patients? And we are going to be talking about a class of drugs that are called thiazolidinidiums, and we are going to understand how they act in the metabolism. So on our last class, we talked about fatty acid synthesis. And um, today we're going to talk what happened once these fatty acids are synthesized. So they can be used to produce triacylglycerol that are going to be stored to be used as an energy source when we need. They can also be incorporated into phospholipids that are components of our membranes. So whenever carbohydrates is ingested in the excess of the organism's capacity to store glycogen, the excess is going to be converted to triacylglycerol and stored in the adipose tissue. So how do we synthesize triacylglycerol and glycerol phospholipids? For that, we need the precursors that are fatty acyl CoA and glycerol 3 phosphate. So where does the glycerol 3-phosphate comes from? And most of it comes from the glycolytic intermediate that is dehydroxyacetone phosphate by the action of the enzyme glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. There is a small amount that can be produced in the liver and kidney through the action of the glycerol kinase. This is what this figure shows. So glucose from glycolysis producing dehydroxyacetone phosphate and then for the glycerol to phosphate. And here, the glycerol to the action of glycerol kinase leading to the production of glycerol to phosphate. So once we have the glycerol free phosphate, now to the process of acylation of the two free hydroxyl groups of glycerol three phosphate by two molecules of paracyl CoA, we can lead to the production of the phosphatidic acid. In the phosphatidic acid, it's the central intermediate in lipid biosynthesis. And once we have this compound, we can produce triacylglycerol or glycerophospholipid. So if you want to produce a glycerophospholipid, there will be the attachment of a head group that could be a serine, a choline, or ethanolamine. And this will lead to the production of glycerophospholipid. On the other side, if you want to produce a triacylglycerol, then through the action of uh, acyl transferase, one to diacylglycerol is going to be uh, transformed into triacylglycerol. So uh, through our diet, we can uh, receive carbohydrates, proteins, and the carbohydrates can lead to the uh, production of glucose, the proteins can uh, generate amino acids uh, once they are metabolized, and uh, these compounds uh, can further lead to the production of acetyl-CoA. That can be used for the synthesis of fat acids and consequently from, from the, those we can synthesize stress And this is going to enable the body to withstand periods of fasting. So what is the triacylglycerol cycle? So the triacylglycerol cycle, uh, we have that approximately 70% of all fat acids released by lipolysis are recertified to form triacylglycerol. Okay, so in a situation that we need energy and the triacylglycerol reserve is mobilized uh, in the adipose tissue, we are going to have the release of fat acids. These fat acids uh, through the body are going to go to the tissues that need energy. But what happened is most part of those go to the liver. And in the liver, they are re-sterified to triacylglycerol. Triacylglycerol is released in the blood and then to the action of lipoprotein lipase can release fat acids that in the adipose tissue are going to be re-sterified as triacylglycerol. So, this um, might seem to be a useless uh, cycle, but actually could represent an energy reserve 
in the bloodstream during fasting. And this could lead to a fast mobilization of energy, of sources for energy when we need it. So uh, a question, some questions um, rose and led to the discovery of a new pathway. And the first question was, what is the source of glycerol to build phosphate to recycle triacylglycerol in the adipose tissue under starvation? So, and this question came because uh, glycolysis is suppressed by the action of glucagon and epinephrine. So little dehydroxyacetone phosphate is available. On the other hand, glycerol released during lipolysis cannot be converted directly to glycerol 3 phosphate in adipose tissue because there is no glycerol kinase there. And then the other question that surged was so why there are two gluconeogenic, gluconeogenic enzymes that are pyruvate carboxylase and phosphenol pyruvate carboxykinase in adipose tissue where glucose is not synthesized. So what is all that about? And actually what happens here is that there is a new path that is called, sorry, that is called glyceroneogenesis. So here I added both glycolysis and gluconeogenesis for your reference with this part of the, those paths uh, magnified. So you can appreciate that glyceroneogenesis and the gluconeogenesis they share some common uh, reactions with pyruvate reduction of pyruvate carboxylase leading to oxaloacetate, and then to phosphenol pyruvate by the action of phosphenol pyruvate carboxykinase. So this is the same that happened in gluconeogenesis. And then after we got the phosphenol pyruvate through a series of reactions, dehydroxyacetone phosphate is going to be pro uh, produced and then glycerol 3 phosphate that can be used for triacylglycerol synthesis. So glycerol neogenesis roles include uh, that together with the resterification of free fat acids, it controls the rate of fat acid release to the blood. It also controls the rate at which free fat acids are delivered to mitochondria to be used in thermogenesis. And in the liver alone supports the synthesis of enough glycerol 3 phosphate to account for up to 65% of fat acid uh, resterified triacylglycerol. So, what about the triacylglycerol cycle, the cycle of regulation? And this figure shows how the cycle, uh, how the, um, the cycle is regulated by glucocorticoid hormones. So actually the regulation occurs at the level of the phosphenol pyruvate carboxykinase, both in the liver and in the adipose tissue. So let's start with the liver. So glucocorticoids increase the expression of the gene encoding phosphenol pyruvate carboxykinase in the liver. And as a consequence, so what we have is an increase in glycerol neogenesis. So this is going to lead to an increase in the synthesis of of triacylglycerol in the liver and they're released to the blood. So at the same time, glucocorticoids, they suppress the expression of gene encoding a phosphenol pyruvate carboxykinase in the adipose tissue. The consequence of this is the decrease in glycerol neogenesis in the adipose tissue. And then recycling of fat acids decline and more fatty acids are released into the blood. So here you are going to understand how the thiazoli DNA genes act to uh, contribute to the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So these um, drugs, they also act um, at the level of phosphenol of pyruvate carboxykinase. So what they do, they reduce the levels of fat acids circulating in the blood and they increase the sensitivity to insulin. They do this through the induction of phosphenol pyruvate carboxykinase in the adipose tissue. And the consequence of that is the increase in glycerol neogenesis. Consequently, there will be an increase in the resynthesis of triacylglycerol in the adipose tissue. And this is going to reduce the release of free fat acids from adipose tissue into the blood. 
So this is important because high levels of free fat acid in the blood interfere with glucose utilization in muscle and promote insulin resistance that leads to type 2 diabetes. So this is how this group of drugs can contribute to the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So for today learning objectives, we have to understand synthesis of triacylglycerols, triacylglycerol cycle, and glyceronelogenesis. So we are going to talk more about these topics in class, and I look forward to see you there.